I've got a great, great round table with me today. We're talking about a very important subject, which is access to healthcare, the challenges and solutions, and how the healthcare workforce is making a shift and uh, how they're adjusting to those challenges. So I'm very excited about today's subject, as well as my guests. Um, I have in the middle, in the middle of your screen, Dr. Victoria Reinhardt. She is a paramedicine consultant, and welcome to the show. Great to be here today. Topic I am incredibly passionate about, so thanks for having me. Yes, yes. So glad to have you. And then we also have a returning guest. Always good to have you, Dr. Alicia Cornell. She is a clinical consultant. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you. So excited to be here and be here with Dr. Victoria and yourself, too. Absolutely. Same here. I've been, been looking forward to this. And, uh, you know, it was interesting how we kind of, this kind of evolved to this point because I sent out something on one of our healthcare groups, a healthcare executive group, has about 125,000 members in it. And Victoria, Dr. Reinhardt, you were one of the ones that responded to that. And then that was a couple of months, a few months ago. And then so we finally made it happen today. And so glad you're here today to, to, to join us. Yeah, absolutely. I always love the things that you post. Lots of, of incredible discussion to be on your thread. So uh, uh, lucky to participate and be able to join you today. Well, I'm, I'm, again, I'm so excited to have you. And then Alicia, I tell you, Dr. Cornell, she has been on so many shows and I just love having her back every single time. She's done all kinds of stuff. She's done Fun and Games Friday. She's done all kinds of serious discussions with us and it's been great. So I know today's going to be great. We have several folks who are already uh, making their comments um, thank you, of course, Joanne, for getting us started. And we also have Michelle Rodriguez Belong. So welcome to you. And uh, for, she says, good afternoon to all of us. So to get right into this, I wanted us to start off, first of all, what are the challenges that you've been seeing um, from your spectrum or from your perspective? And uh, Victoria, maybe we can start with you. What have you, what's some, some of the challenges you've seen uh, here in the recent months uh, or perhaps recent years, if you want to go back that far, and then, then we'll get into some of the solutions. Yeah, so I think that a lot of the challenges we have seen over recent months really have been challenges for years that have simply been highlighted by the pandemic. And we know that access to care is something that is widely talked about, but can affect patients and, you know, really all of healthcare in a, in a a multitude of, of ways. Some of the most prominent issues that I deal with working with EMS teams and interprofessional teams that do mobile health care to deliver care within the home or at the patient's bedside uh, have to do with chronic disease management, access to specialists in a timely manner, and medication challenges that are contributing to patient harm. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. That's 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 definitely a lot. We're gonna we're definitely gonna cover a lot as much as we can of that because in in this next hour, and then uh, uh, Dr. Alicia Cornell, Alicia, what have you seen from your perspective, or what have you been hearing in terms of some of the challenges that we're facing, uh, especially in recent months, or perhaps recent years? Yes. Yeah, so very similar to what Dr. Victoria just talked about. Um, right now in our area, uh, a lot of our patients that um, are being given additional instructions to stay at home and how to take care of themselves better at home, which has its you know, positives, but also some negative impact of are they really trained? Are they educated? Um, what does the home health situation look like? Uh, recently, we had a newscast that asked patients if you know you have to call 911, there may not be an emergency vehicle that's ready for you um, to come and pick you up because of COVID-19 and the pandemic. So some of the solutions that I, you know, I work with in the tech space for this are finding uh, monitoring uh, um, devices at home to support home health, to support that community initiative, being able to um, have uh, remote monitoring, being able to have trained healthcare clinicians that are able to go into the home and take care of more than what they have been used to and accommodated um, for that education. And then uh, finally, um, asking uh, family members, what type of education and training are family members that are providing this type of support? Because there's a, a gap and there's, there's a not a bridge all the time between, do I even know if I need healthcare, where do I go? 
How do I get that health care? Um, and then being able to understand insurance what's going to be available for you. And a lot of the solutions that we have that are fantastic are not supported by insurance because of the cost. And because we don't have any data to really support, does that method actually work? So we have a lot of great things in the tech space for it, but then it's not always supported by insurance yet. So that's a, a huge gap that I'm seeing um, for that access to healthcare. Absolutely. Uh, and so one of the things too, that one of my, uh, colleagues so in fact she couldn't make it on the show she was going to be with us she had mentioned this to me and i wanted to make sure i i shared this note and i wanted to get y'all's comments on this because i thought it was quite interesting um she says that uh with primary docs not accepting covid patients and sending them to the er's i'm hearing it's clogging up the er's which is increasing the access issue for other uh, emergency situations uh, she also says the equipment is scarce as well as leading healthcare workers to make difficult decisions on who gets the equipment. And as for staff, they're dealing with higher acuity and higher numbers of patients, therefore also higher numbers of bad outcomes. Um, I was talking with one director who said she got a card with a Superman cape. She said she doesn't feel like Superman. She feels like a more like a more like a Sylvester Stallone in the Rocky scene after he was beat up badly and calling for Adrian. It seems they're using all of their training, tenacity, and will to survive to attack this opponent as for what they're doing for the staff one hospital is teaming up with staff with the rn so that they can answer the physician calls run for supplies and do other responsibilities while the rns do just what they are licensed to do it's an all hands on deck approach and people mm -hmm. are dropping some of the previous barriers related to job descriptions on the positive side telemedicine has made primary services more available so I don't know if you wanted to, that was by Dr. Julie Olson. Thank you for, for sending that in, Julie. I don't know if you have any comments on that you, that you wanted to add. Victoria, did you want to add something to that? I would say absolutely. We see our ERs being overrun. You know, we have, we have underserved, we have poor, we have minority patients, elderly patients. They can't get the access they need. And telehealth is a solution. It's a fantastic solution. It's, it's demonstrated to us that, you know, we can modify how we deliver care or get a little bit creative in that and have a lot of success in eliminating the access to care issue. But it's not an end all fix to everything. And one of the things that I love to, you know, to mention a, a colleague of mine, Ken Peach, who's an innovator in the field of EMS and, and mobile integrated healthcare delivery, uh, we joke about the term attended telehealth. Uh, telehealth only gets you so far if, you know, your elderly patient cannot navigate that technology or if your minority patient cannot in understand the instructions because of language barriers. And so, you know, there still are a lot of challenges with telehealth where having someone in the home to help the patient navigate that or even do in-home physical assessment that is more in-depth than something like, you know, an ox, you know, an O2 monitor or a blood pressure cuff can provide. There is incredible value to that for clinical teams as we are navigating COVID and telehealth specifically. But related to, you know, the ERs and and the recent news about the fact that you can call 911 and maybe an ambulance is not going to come. It is because of the healthcare system being overrun, but it is also related to the fact that if anybody is listening and unaware, only 11 states at this time consider emergency medical services to be an essential service. Oh, which means wow. that the majority, I know it is surprising. when you, <laughs> yeah, when you really that. That. <laughs> that is very surprising. I did not know that. And it is hugely impactful because it has a dramatic impact on funding. Uh, so, you know, whereas police or fire are considered essential services and then have funding revenues that are, you know, federal and on the state level, we do not have that for a lot of states. Uh, within the U.S. And so for EMS, it relies a lot on volunteer services, on uh, patients who are entering the healthcare arena or, or caregivers who are entering the healthcare arena, more so than physicians or nurses, as an example. And ultimately, we have uh, a lack of staffing. 
because we don't have the funding necessary to create EMS as a career opportunity. And so again, that's, these are passions of mine because it's what I do within my company, right? Is expand these models of care, utilize our EMS service, reinvest in those services with additional training so that they have what you were talking about, Alicia, which is the training and, and, you know, expertise at the bedside, in the patient's home, in the communities that our physicians and our nurse practitioners, our providers need. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, I, you know, it's like, that's 50 states, only 11. Wow. That, that is amazing. So James Castle just came in. He says, there we go. Good day all. Thank you, James, for being here. He was commenting on our discussion as a prelude to this meeting. So glad that he was, he was able to actually join us. And I remember, I think Michelle was also coming in as well. So glad that, that y'all are here. Please pipe in with your comments, your thoughts, uh, whatever you'd like to add to the discussion, as well as questions from ourselves or our guests, that would be that would be much appreciated. Mm-hmm. Um, and she, in fact, Michelle says that statistic is shocking, so that it shocked her as well. Um, what are some things we can look at as possible solutions? Uh, but you know what? Before I do that, Alicia, I don't know if I, I want to make sure I didn't cover over something you were going to say. Um, no, actually, just to piggyback on to what Dr. Victoria said, I work with a colleague. He is a nurse and um, he's also an EMS um, a, a trainer and a consultant. He did he did both. And one of the things that his name is uh, Scott McConnell. And one of the things that Scott talks about are always these things that Victoria is saying is um, first we talked about rural health communities that don't have access to health care. Um, and the burden needed for additional training by EMS in that area so that they can identify, recognize, and then do more treatment in the home when it comes um, to taking care of patients in the home. And sometimes um, I heard uh, from the other Dr. Olson's comment about, you know, um, having this we call it recognition and retention in nursing during this time. And it's very, 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 very difficult. Um, One of the lectures I give is on coaching minority women in healthcare roles. And when when Dr. Victoria talks about these healthcare statistics and only having 10%, one of the things that I found that was really, really shocking while doing my research was that we as minorities, not just women, just minorities in healthcare roles that diagnose, that treat, and support are less than 20% of the healthcare population of workers. And it is in that gap that we see when you don't have or you have a a bigger issue of this access to healthcare and having people to come into a care area to receive the care, preventative care, especially primary care that they really need so that they're not left at home with chronic disease and don't know what to do when things happen. But it is, it is, Everything is so connected between why we have these gaps, people not having access to healthcare, and then understanding like what are the things that we have to do. You named it EMS. I mean, it is like I started taking a look on we do road trips sometimes. I started taking a look. How far is the nearest hospital? In the middle of nowhere, North Carolina, the South has a lot of like middle of nowhere places. Like, how far is it? And what would you do if you were having a baby? What were you, you know, what happens if you have a traumatic incident that happens? You know, how do you how do you provide care? What what is that strategic outlook for providing this care? What does that network actually look like? And I think the more we dig, the more we find these pervasive statistics. Whereas we think. If you get insurance, if you have a good, you know, a way to pay for your health insurance, it you can't see it. It's when you don't have all of this access to health care. I can get telehealth right now. I can call my doctor. I can schedule an appointment with technology. I can do all of that. But I'm a different person sitting in this chair than many of the people who do not have access to health care. And those aren't opportunities that are available for them. And to me, those are our vulnerable people that we don't have an answer to all the time. That, that's that's all that I really had to add. You know, that's our ongoing work is how do we solve that? What is it? It's not going to stop. There's millions of people that don't get these same opportunities that we all have. Um, and how do you do that? And how do you operate 
because you yeah. still, you know, you have to figure that whole part of that out about access in this healthcare. And at COVID-19, I worked on a project for value-based care. It's transforming rapidly. Um, a lot of things are just coming down to what's the minimal that we can do and what can you do as a patient and, and how can we really help you? So it's a lot of, it's a lot of narrowing going on right now. Yeah. Well, and I, a, a, go, ahead, go ahead, Victoria, please. Go, please. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. So I think though that it's, it's really incredible what you are discussing about minority providers mm -hmm. because you know, there, even within the EMS industry, there is a very small number of women and minority providers mm -hmm. within EMS and in the first responder realm. So the issues related to, to burnout and, and equal opportunity in those fields is, is incredibly valuable when we talk about utilizing these workforces to go into our communities. And are we sending out healthcare providers and you know, professionals that look like our communities. And we know that these issues that minorities experience related to access to care, uh, yes, we, we're talking about telehealth, we're talking about a lot of different things today, but another one that comes up, you know, from my heart as a pharmacist, we now have one in three neighborhoods that are in what we call a pharmacy desert. And this is because we have the closing of independent pharmacies in these smaller communities. Mm -hmm. And the pharmacies that are being built and opened by some of our larger chains are not typically in minority neighborhoods. Yep. And so this creates also the issue of medication access playing in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is, that's right. And, and, you know, the, the stat, too, that Alicia gave uh, about 20%. When you look at the population, the last time I looked, it's over 40% in the United States, and they predict that the minority will become the majority, I guess, in terms of, you know, uh, you know the, mm -hmm. the population shift within the next 20 years. So uh, what, how, how someone feels about it personally, it doesn't matter. It's going to happen. Mm -hmm. it, <laughs> so is, it, do, is. Do, it is. How do we address it, you know? And we have to, you know, like, just... Um, different roles. A lot of people that come to me, you know, they want to be nurses, want to be nurses. And I'm like, look beyond that. You may actually mm -hmm. feel like you want to be a nurse because your mother was one or you, you know, you may see somebody, but look beyond the health that. And so look at the whole lens of healthcare to really think about where could you do the most where can you be the most beneficial and then talk to people or, you know, just really get a different perspective of, of what that I sat next to this paramedic. I was getting my nails done, but she was a paramedic and we had this wonderful conversation. This lady talked about her job with so much compassion. She loved what she did and she lived in a rural area and she loved her schedule. She loved going out in the field. She loved the high intensity of things. And I was, it was us and in between two young ladies that were in high school. And so I was like, you know, are y'all listening to this conversation? Like this is another route that is fulfilling. You can be fulfilled doing this. And they, uh, the nail tech asked her, you don't want to be a nurse? And she was like, oh, gosh, no. I had to. Some of the EMS uh, technicians, some of the techs and stuff were getting off of the truck, going into the EDs. And she said, I don't like being in a closed in space. I like being on the truck. I like being out there in the field. So, you know, it's more like. You know, for people to understand what type of personality do you have? You might not really like I, I worked at the bedside for many years only to walk away and say, I actually did not always like that job. I like what I'm doing a lot better. But having a clinical um, knowledge and working with and collaborating with other clinicians in the tech space. That's what I like to do. And so it's like, you know, just be more open to see what else is out there because there's lots of other roles that are available. I, I want to go back. Now we're on this, 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 we know what, before I do that, I do want to, I see a comment came in. This is a comment from James and, and you can, you can choose whether you want to comment on this or not. Um, he says, my question is more to the challenges hospitals are facing with ransomware done by threat actors who risk attacks against computer assisted devices, such as Wi-Fi systems, uh, data privacy bre breaches. 
Do most hospitals pay the ransom? And if so, where do hospitals recover these costs in the United States? So if either of you want to address that, feel free. Any thoughts on that? Um, I have known a few hospitals in California. There's been a couple that have actually been under ransom and they have had their electronic health records under attack and kidnapped. Um, and they requested Bitcoin. So it was cryptocurrency that was actually requested. I don't know how it gets paid back, but they had they paid so that they could um, you know, get those records back and stop their work for a time. So I'm not really sure about how they got it paid back or where that money came from. But that has been, um, I've seen that, especially with the implementation of electronic health records. Um, and what I've seen hospitals do to safeguard against that is they start getting more um, uh, IT assistants, CTOs, technology officers to support the firewalls, to support the security, and it really enhance their security services around protecting um, patient records. Makes sense. And we also got another one. Uh, Victoria, do you have anything on that before I move on? No, I don't, I don't believe so. I think that the concept there is just, you know, demonstrative of how careful a lot of newer healthcare entities that have launched into the digital space really need to be, because those are real challenges that you have to consider and have an IT team that is prepared to handle. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, Leon, glad to have you. Leon is joining. He says, that's why we are thankful for FQHCs and need more of them. And, uh, Michelle says, I started my career in a hot pre-hospital role. It was the best foundation I could have asked for the introspection into the true community challenges that should inform our collective approach. Appreciate that. And Ava says, no one is talking about the, our in- educational instructions in mm-hmm. underserved, under- underserved communities aren't preparing, aren't preparing students for professional careers. Most of these schools don't even have the technology needed to prepare this digital revolution. So any of those things you would you either, either you like to comment on Victoria, you have anything you want to comment on and then Alicia? Well, I think that I, I will just start by saying that I agree that a lot of the underserved communities, there is a huge gap as far as, you know, STEM learning and preparation for healthcare professions. There has been in recent years an increase in federal funding for entities who are going to launch programs in underserved areas uh, that are aimed at increasing educational opportunities. So that is a step in the positive direction. Uh, but of course, there are there are limitations where um, some companies are doing some really great things and may not be able to access that funding. So uh, you know, it is it is a huge challenge that we're seeing in underserved communities. Education is certainly part of my heart and and is something that. Uh, a lot of us in the healthcare professions need to be aware of so that we can contribute to expanding access and opportunity for um, getting people from those communities into the healthcare professions. And then regarding, you know, the comment about uh, a pre-hospital role being a great foundation for a healthcare career, you know, your insight there about what you learned about your communities, what you learned about medical emergencies, about uh, the true issues and challenges that patients are dealing with on a regular basis that really to a lot of new graduates and a lot of new healthcare providers is, is unfathomable. You know, you can't even mm-hmm. imagine the living situations and the true barriers that people have. So I can, I just really want to say thank you for that comment. And, and I appreciate the candor there. And I find uh, myself as well to, for that to be incredibly true. Mm-hmm. Same. I feel the same way too. Um, the community that we live in, um, and and you right, and I hadn't really thought about um, until recently. Like all of these uh, pharmacies, all these chain pharmacies are. I see them everywhere. And then I said, but when I go to a different side of town, I don't see them as often. And that's something that you know, or the small mom and pop. Um, you know, pharmacies that know the community are being closed down. They can't compete because they don't have um, the, the money sometimes to, to continue to compete. The other part about the education is two programs that I know we have we have here in Durham. There is a citizen, a city of medicine academy. And it is it's the first um, 
school, it's a high school, it's the first school that I have seen that is dedicated to healthcare. You can go to school uh, by the time they're finished, they can be a certified nursing assistant. Some of them do start their uh, EMT programs there. They really, so a lot of it is pre-med for, for people who want that, but there's all of the additional roles that also support providers that diagnose and treat. That's first one that I've seen um, in my area where that is, um, and Durham has a large underserved community. And so to be able to see these kids be able to have the choice and the option of going to this school, it's like they start their career. Everybody is not going to end up being a provider. You don't have to. That's, you know, we, we have a need for everything. And so to be able to go and make a decision, first of all, it is definitely supporting the community because you have uh, a chain being broken. So you have some additional finances, some additional money, education um, from a member of that community. The next thing is, is being able to place that person within a hospital or healthcare situation and to be able to understand the experience of who they're seeing. Um, they may have been, um, I, I used to know a young lady, she was the first in her generation to actually go to college. Um, she was a Latina. She was very, very proud. Her uh, family had come from another country within recently. So she was doing something um, that was going to be a legacy for other people in her family and her friends to really follow in those footsteps. And we have to do more things like that and, and really, you know, ask and lobby for funding to be able to promote that type of education base with our younger generation to introduce them to, it's not an escape from your community. This is another way to support your community. Um, this is a way to help bridge that gap and to, and to really help be more influential in your community that, hey, I came, for me, I was broke when I was young. So for me sitting, being able to be who I am now, and I have younger people in my family, other people, how did you get on this road? How did that happen for you? You know, how is that? Or I just had a conversation with two of my family members this morning. Both of them are diabetics. One of them is uh, on very expensive diabetes medication. The other had questions about he uh, eating, uh, exercising, to be able to sit there and facilitate that conversation. And sometimes we write notes. When you go to your doctor's office, this is what I want you to ask. Because you leave out and you come and ask me, I want you to be in a relationship with your provider. So that way you can start talking to them and trusting your provider has your best interest at heart. Um, so those are some of the things that, um, you know, I think about about this access to care, these uh, these solutions is how do we start? We have right now solutions current and then we have things in the future. What strategy can we do to build up for the next generation of people to be able to do this? OK, this is great. So I love this discussion. But, you know, normally about this time, we usually have a little water break. I don't think I told you about you guys about this. So you usually have a water <laughs> break. So as we as we uh, take a little bit of water here, if you've got some, go ahead and take some. I have a question for you, and uh, <clears throat> a little little little, uh, little fun question. I like to add a little some fun questions in here. We'll get back to your comments. I see. I do see another comment here. This is one of my would you rather questions, and then you can just tell us which one you uh, prefer of these two. It's going to be a tough choice, though. Um. Okay. Given a choice of five mystery items, oh. <laughs> you're you're forced to eat something. Would you rather be forced to eat something you could taste first but not see, or eat something you could smell first but not taste? Hmm. Smell. You smell? Okay. Why'd you pick that one? I got it. That's my sense. That's my number one go-to. I got to smell it first. I don't care what it looks like. If it smells like it's good, I'll eat it. <laughs> okay. No, I, I, I think I would go with taste. Okay. I think I would go with taste. I think because, you know, texture can be an issue, right? <laughs> Depending on uh, for some people. And so I think if I could taste it, as long as that's fine, then I'll, I can handle it, even if it smells bad. Can you think of anything that you tasted first, but you just ended up not liking it or liking it and you didn't know you would like it? Anything come to mind? 
for you, Victoria. And then I'm going to ask uh, Alicia about the smelling part. Oh, that I that I did not think I was going to like, and I did like. Yeah. I'll I'll give you the opposite. I thought that I would love sushi, and I don't like it at all. <laughs> I, oh, I, I mean, how can you not love sushi? I feel like I love every individual component of sushi. I just don't right. like it all together. <laughs> I can see that. Okay. And how about you, Alicia? Is there, is there something that you, it smelled good, but when you had it and tasted it, it just did not taste good? Or maybe something didn't smell so good and you ended up liking it? Just curious. Anything come to mind? <laughs> yeah, because I'm from the South, uh, chitlins. <laughs> <laughs> They stink, but somehow, some way around the holiday time, I managed to get some from my from my husband's aunt that makes them like so good. And I can only eat like a little, little bit of it, but it's so good. I've never had chitlins. One of these days I'm going to try chitlins. I've never had it. You got to be ready for it. And you got to be... <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be ready for it, and you have to get it from someone who knows how to make it. it I look for the oldest person I can pretend I possibly okay. can find <laughs> because they know all of the tricks that make it taste good. If you ever have it from someone who doesn't know how to do it, it, it is a horrific. <laughs> mm, yeah, you might, you might end up needing healthcare after <laughs> if you know. <laughs> That actually brings me back to our main discussion because that's <laughs> with healthcare, it's the same thing, right? You can have one person that gets in, involved in the process that wasn't the right fit, yep. and they can make a make it a horrific experience. Um, I'm curious for you, uh, Dr. Reinhardt, what was it that inspired you to start this mobile health company? Because you were working within the healthcare system, um, had some leadership positions there, but then here you you decide to to take on this, this company, what inspired you? What was the need that you were trying to fill? And then what's your, what's your goal or vision with it? Well, it happened, it happened very organically. Uh, you know, I was brought in as a consultant when uh, the realm of paramedicine. So paramedicine, if anybody is unfamiliar with that, what paramedicine is, is that we take EMS personnel so paramedics, EMTs, first responders, and we provide additional training in chronic disease, social determinants of health, substance use disorders, public health topics like COVID, and we send them out into our community on a proactive basis, so on a non-emergent basis, for patients who have been frequently utilizing the healthcare system. So if they're calling 911 frequently, if they are bouncing back to the hospital, utilizing the ERs, uh, something about that patient's needs are not being met. And so we utilize EMS and first responders in a role that proactively sends them to the community along with access to interprofessional healthcare teams. And we utilize them to solve this access to care problem. And so that's what paramedicine is or community paramedicine, also known as mobile integrated health when we, when we combine paramedics with mobile uh, interprofessional teams. And so, you know, it came on very organically. I was brought in as a consultant, so to speak, for uh, for a county that had gotten a grant to start a program like this. And we started, you know, discussing the challenges and we ended up uh, modifying approach to include paramedics along with a pharmacist to address the chronic disease and medication challenges. And we did a pilot over three years and it was wildly successful. We were able to demonstrate a savings of over $5 million over the course of three years that we wow. were able to reduce healthcare costs. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so wildly successful. And it shows that this really does improve access to care and eliminate unnecessary healthcare costs. And so, you know, it started organically. I, I said, let's try it, you know, and I was in a faculty role at the time teaching in a college of pharmacy. LECOM is a, a, um, a, a DO school and college of pharmacy. And, uh, and eventually, you know, we did this pilot and I fell in love with the model. I saw that it worked. I saw the lives that we were impacting. And now I am the CEO of Mobile Health Consultants, where uh, we take uh, these communities where you have uh, an access to care issue 
<clears throat> you have ERs and the 911 system being overrun. Secondary to that, you have rising healthcare costs because of inappropriate use of resources. And we train and deploy mobile interprofessional teams that are paramedic based. And what we see as a result is we have more appropriate use of healthcare resources. We have uh, an overall lowering of healthcare costs. And ultimately, and what we really care about is we have healthier communities. Mm. Absolutely. I appreciate that. So, uh, James, uh, he, he had a comment earlier. He said, as a former emergency medical responder instructor for the Canadian Red Cross, I really want to say thank you to the whole medical industry for keeping our countries able to survive this global pandemic and in giving us a true chance for survivability in Canada and the United States. Thanks for your services. So that was that was from James. Uh, and... We also have, uh, oh, and Michelle, thank you. Appreciate you joining us. Thank you. She, she had to run. One of the things I want to ask uh, both of you, I'm going to start with you, Alicia. If you had the ability, what is the first thing you would tackle um, out of the things that we, you know, all the issues we're talking about when it comes to access to health care, what's the first thing you would want to tackle if you had the, the resources and the ability to fix it? Oh, healthcare transformation. Um, I would want to improve the model of healthcare that we have in, <clears throat> excuse me, in this country um, today. I, you know, from my perspective, I feel like we're very reactive um, to a lot of things, and we are not proactive in preparing people for their disease processes. How can they prevent things that are that can happen, you know, and how can they be better prepared when they receive a diagnosis? Maybe it's a, a genetic disorder or issue of how, how to prepare and how to stay educated and trained for that. Um, I think by being more proactive and changing our entire model of care, what we do is we flip what we have now and put it forward. Um, the community health is really, really huge to me because you know, really healthcare started in the community. This we we took care of ourselves in the community initially. And I think bringing that back, I would love to be able to, uh, we have a, a set of clinics here that are provider owned and they partner up with business teams, a franchise. I enjoy going to that clinic because it's around the corner for me. I trust the people there live in this community. They know what's going on. They know um, me and my, you know, my husband, they know us really well. And it's, it's small. And I and I think that a lot of people are often intimidated by the bureaucracy of our healthcare model, by how much, you know, you, you're, they're afraid to ask their, their provider, I need this medication, I feel like I need it, and then have the provider be able to explain why you don't and different methods they, that they want to choose. I try a lot of things. I do stuff just to see, you know, oh, what is that benefit? I'm going to try that. I'm going to try that. I went to my primary care doctor. We talked about, um, you know, as I'm maturing and seasoning, that <laughs> things that I can do, <laughs> things that I can do to, you know, remain seasoned well. <laughs> and um, one of the things she had me do, I went to a nutritionist. Um, and, you know, talked about that. Um, she um, asked if I wanted medications for um, to help me with my weight loss and different things. We had an entire consultation. She gave me the names. She gave me documents that I could read on, you know, if I wanted to take a medication to help start things. She gave me things, information. She talked to me about my um, my age, the things that I should expect, things that I could prepare for. To me, when I left out and seen all the resources that I actually had at this clinic, they have a, a patient internet. You can go on, you can read things, you can watch videos. When I left out, I felt like one, she values me, not just my business. She values my business, but she values me as a human. Mm -hmm. Number two, she was very, very open to any question that I had. I did not, uh, there are some things that were happening that could potentially land me in a hospital bed if I don't take care of myself. 
so being able to be in your community, having that access, being able to say, hey, there are things that I can go in and talk to my doctor because I don't like technology. It's a lot of people, Dr. Victoria mentioned that elderly, some of our more elderly people, uh, people who are not uh, natives to this country who have a difficulty with that barrier, being able to say, come on in, see somebody that understands your experience in your community. Let me help you. And then when you're going to the hospital, it is because I no longer can help you in your community. It is because you've had a um, young boy next door to us. He's a boy. He dug into some yellow jackets. He's got he's stung all over. I went next door and I was like, what are you going to do? I don't know, but I'm going to do something when I go to help because, you know, I mean, he got stung by yellow jackets. But what if if something happened and he had an allergic reaction, if our EMS team could come out and take care of him right there in his home, give him the treatment that he needed, monitor him, give him instruction, and then leave. We've cut down on costs. He does not have to go to an emergency room, which is super expensive. He does not have to see the ED doctor, which means that that's a bed available for someone else who may have a very, very uh, a worse off condition. Mm -hmm. And and it's he's in his home. So he feels yeah. more safe. He feels more relaxed. The parents are all involved. And I, that's what I would do. This whole transformation and, you know, flipping this model um, to be more strategic, I'll start in the community and then let's branch out. And then people who have these really you know, bad chronic conditions, cancer, all of these things, you know, uh, uh, diseases where they need to come to the hospital to an academic setting and receive right, right. a higher level of care. That's when we can understand how is that, you know, cost effective. But being out in our communities first and handling, taking care of things, I think we miss that so much. We miss that opportunity. And that's where we start. So I think coming back, going back to the beginning. It's almost like uh, the community uh, becomes part of the triage unit. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Who goes into, who goes into the facility? What, what's your thoughts on this, Victoria? What, what would be, if you had the one thing you could fix, what, what would you start with? Well, we're going to say it different ways, but my answer is exactly the same in, in that perspective. Because, you know, what I do is literally create teams and send them into the community, right? Mm -hmm. So you start in the community. And that's, you know, if I had to choose tomorrow what I would want to do, I would want every single community in the United States to have access to one of these mobile interprofessional teams who comes to your home and sees you. You want to talk about, you know, who knows Mrs. Smith down the street who's fallen three times this month and, uh, and can't get her medicines and who's, you know, lost uh, 20 pounds over the last three months because she's malnourished and doesn't have access to food. And, you know, you want to talk about who knows that it's your EMS professionals mm -hmm. who keep mm -hmm. responding to her home for falls. And so that's what I would change. It's a no brainer to equip these teams with additional training, equip them with access either virtually or, or coupled there in the community in person to, you know, other healthcare professionals who know chronic disease, who know, uh, you know, emergency triage, who know all of these other elements of healthcare that we need to incorporate, social workers, et cetera. And that's what I would do. So we're saying in two different ways, but both of us are coming to the conclusion that you need to start in your community. You do. Yeah. I love that social worker too. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll add even your counselors, your therapy, uh, being able to have that and being, especially right now, a lot of people are, experiencing, um, um, we got, I started calling it people detox because of the pandemic, you know, being saying it does the stay uh, in shelters and, and not being able to go uh, work. Um, so they may be at home more and that people detox can be overwhelming mentally. And so, you know, now we have, you know, people in your community that they, they may be having a hard time. If I know that I can simply pick up the phone and call somebody. I, I've had people that I've known personally, um, even recently, who have told me, hey, I went to a therapist because I, I was not having good thoughts about myself. And I felt, you know, I, I, I felt that I should 
not have those thoughts, but to be able to call somebody and maybe your EMS comes over and says, you know, what's what's actually happening? Um, I don't know if anybody has ever experienced a panic attack. I have. And I experienced a panic attack one time in the garage of my car in the middle of summer in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Dangerous, mm -hmm. supremely dangerous. I the I had telehealth on my phone that I could call and have somebody talk me down. But the danger of that is if I, what if I sat there and I'm frozen and I'm stuck and it's in, I'm in a garage and what I don't want to happen is now happening because I'm stuck in this hot garage and I'm sweltering and I can't get out of my car, you know? So if I'm able to call my EMS to come, if I didn't have telehealth, but I knew I could call that EMS number, you know, to come in and help me, save me. And, you know, it's like, those are the type of relationships that I would love to see us establish so that people can feel, I think what I'm, I'm trying to say is people don't feel safe accessing healthcare sometimes because they are afraid of costs. They are afraid of having to go through so many layers to be able to get the services that they need. They don't, if you have Medicaid and Medicare, sometimes you don't want to do this. Because you don't want to have to tell your story time and time and time again, just to be able to have uh, your, in, you know, something approved that you really need. Right. So. Makes sense. Uh, mm -hmm. By the way, Prakash, pre thank you for your comment. He says, uh, nice to, he says, hi, nice to see you. And then uh, also another comment that came in. I want to make sure I catch that. Um Oh, Esther, Esther Horowitz. Hey, good to see you. She says, absolutely, uh, Alicia. People should always have local relationships with providers as their base of good care. So, yeah, absolutely. So love that. Appreciate that. Now, you mentioned something earlier, uh, Dr. Reinhardt, that I want to pick up on. And that was because it's not recognized in so many states, it makes it difficult to recruit people into the space. So what's the first step to fix that to get, if we're going to have, if we're going to all of a sudden have more care in the communities, we have to have more people, we have to have more mm -hmm. staffing um, or, or, or maybe some of the staff that's in the hospital ends up moving out that way. What are some things you think should be done in order to make it where it's more feasible to recruit people into that space specifically, instead of just going straight to the hospital? So, I mean, it feels pretty simple to me. A livable wage is is to start with, right? That person that's coming to literally save your life and whose skill set we rely on at the absolute most critical moment. You know, what are they getting? Thirteen dollars an hour? Fifteen dollars an hour? They can't even I don't know. feed their I don't own. Know. Is, that, is that what it yeah, is? Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, a livable wage is is absolutely step number one. Uh, a lot of these teams again are relying on volunteer because of lack of funding. And so, I mean, that feels like a no brainer, right? How, how much longer can we keep that industry running with pizza and, uh, and, and things of that nature, right? With, if they don't have access to a livable wage and insurance and uh, wow. benefits that they deserve, that's, that's number one. I think also, you know, people go into EMS and they're within the United States is not a there's not an extensive career pathway that a lot of people um, find rewarding. OK, now you can move up the chain and you can you can get into chief roles and director roles. And, and depending on what type of EMS or emergency medical services agency you are a part of, that looks a little bit different. Um, but, you know, ultimately, um, other countries are probably ahead of us in that game. They have curriculums that move people up almost similar to like the nursing profession, right? So you can start, you know, as an LPN and then you can work your way all the way up to a nurse practitioner. And that breeds uh, incentive for people that uh, re, you know, reinforces the need to be a lifelong learner that uh, helps make the most of every single nurse that we have. We know nurses are some of the most amazing healthcare professionals. And when you have a nurse that 
that shows exceptional talent, there's room for her or him to grow and to move up to to work at the best of their potential. And we don't always have that within emergency medical services. And so that's why a big backbone of what I do is training and providing new opportunities for non-traditional roles for EMTs and paramedics so that uh, that field continues to be inviting and rewarding and allows people to practice at the top of what their own skill set becomes. So once they get into the field, once they become an EMT or, or in paramedicine, you're helping to train them on how they can get to that next level of income, whether I guess is it an ER physician or what, what is it, what's the next step for them? Well, and that's the thing is uh, unless you are going to move into like a chief role where you may or may not be providing uh, direct patient care, uh, there there's not really like a full curriculum uh, within the paramedic field. Uh, we now have what we call a community paramedic certification, uh, which can sometimes allow for, you know, additional roles like community paramedicine or mobile integrated health or delivering care in the model that we've been discussing today with EMS professionals uh, being the solution to the access to care problem. Um, and sometimes that does result in additional money or pay with that role. But like if you wanted to become an ER physician or a nurse practitioner, really your solution is to stop being a paramedic and then go to medical school or go to nursing school. And uh, we call them unicorns in our field, uh, people that have dual certification where they are a nurse practitioner and still a paramedic or, you know, are a physician that has kept or maintained their paramedic license because that's not that's not incredibly common. Wow. wow. That's yeah. So it makes it makes it difficult. OK, so I cannot believe how quickly this hour has passed. I do have to give you one more fun question and then I want you to give whatever tip you would like, whoever, whether, whoever you want to hear this. Let's give a great tip or a solution as what we can do to help address some of the access to health care issues that are out there, whatever you feel the most passionate about. Um, OK, so here's my question. Would you rather to have no short-term memory or no long-term memory if you had to choose? <laughs> it's two terrible options, right? <laughs> horrible, horrible options. <laughs> two, two terrible options. I guess, um, I guess I would have to say no long-term as, as that's, it's terrible to give up memories from long ago. And, you know, I, I guess as you age, that would look like uh, giving up memories of when you got married and when your children were born or when you got your first job. And there's a lot of meaning in that. But I think that uh, especially in our elderly now, uh, they can remember things from a long time ago and that does not help their functioning status day to day. Ooh. And they struggle because their short-term memory is gone. And so I think myself personally and seeing dementia run in my family, uh, that I would probably be less of a burden on my own family if I could keep my short-term memory. Uh -huh. Now, see, if I didn't ask that question, I would have learned that about you. The fact that you have dementia in your family, it's a concern and issue for you. So thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Okay, now, Alicia, what mm -hmm. about you? Would you rather have no short-term memory or no long-term memory? No long-term memory. Not all memories are good. So I would rather be able to have my short-term memory and be able to function from right there. Um, that's, yeah, that's what I would want. That's that's powerful too. That's another great point. Yes. And then I, 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 you know, you would always have an excuse if you forgot something too. <laughs> I guess that's another thing I think about. Like if I- How am I, I supposed to remember? <laughs> yeah, if I, if I if I knew I didn't have a long term memory, I, you know, and you can't get mad at me if I forgot to do something. It's like I'm sorry. Exactly. I exactly. <laughs> unless you told me, unless you told me like five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, uh, it's been fantastic today. Share. Let's share quickly your what, what's your what's your your parting words. Um, each of you, maybe in about a minute or two, give us your parting words, and, and also how people should contact you. Um, uh, Victoria, you want to start off? 
Sure. I think my parting words are that this has been a really difficult, uh, we want to say last year, last two years now at this point, and related to access to care, sometimes it's just helping the one patient in front of you, and, and that can be enough. So even if you only help one patient today uh, with increasing their access to care in some way, shape, or form, uh, thank you for doing that, and, and that's enough. Awesome. Very good. How about you, Dr. Cornell? Um, I learned so much from Dr. Reinhardt today. I really did. This is impressive. I had a really, really good conversation. I love that. Um, the other thing I would say is um, don't be discouraged if you are a clinician, if you are in any administrative, I don't care what your role is. If you are a part of the healthcare community, that's what you are. You belong. Do not be discouraged. Lean on others to support you through the pandemic. Make use of the benefits that are available to you. Not, we don't want any more pizza. Everybody does not want that. And just to be, you know, to be, stay encouraged that and hopeful that the people that you're seeking out or who do you want to, who do you need to be around to be in support of you are sometimes not the people that you work alongside of. And this is an opportunity for us to be thankful for our family, however it may be, whatever you call your family, how you, you know, structure it and to just be, you know, really thoughtful about coming to work, not being burned out, not being exhausted, minimizing conversations, taking care of people, just focusing and then coming home and relaxing and finding a place where you can be safe and you can relax because this is hard and, and everybody's in this together right now. Excellent. Well, both of you were great today. This was beyond all expectations. It was a wonderful conversation. So yes. let's go ahead and say bye to everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, friends. <laughs> okay, stay on for just a second, and then Joanne will let me know uh, when it's okay to hit the stop button on the stream. I learned it the hard way because one time, I actually several times, I cut myself off in the middle of talking. <laughs> I think we're probably good here. Let's double check. Are we good, uh, Joanne? Just say uh, you're good now, Rob.